right. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our first panel discussion of the day, um, Scaling Up Financing in Vietnam. Um, this session is uh, moderated by Naveen, who is the Special Advisor for Southeast Asia in, uh, for GWEC. Uh, we'll have two presentations. So our first presentation is from Arvinder Singh, who is Senior uh, Treasury Sales Manager for Asia Pacific at NRG Systems. Uh, our second presentation uh, will be from Jeffrey Tan, uh, who is Managing Director of the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation. And then we'll move to a panel discussion um, with both those presenters, as well as Olivier Duguet, who is CEO of the Blue Circle, um, uh, Tan Hai Nguyen, who is Senior Associate uh, for Energy Mining and Infrastructure at Baker McKenzie, and Steve Mercia, uh, Project and Infrastructure Finance Executive Director at Standard Charter. So I'll now pass it over to Naveen, um, who will kick off the session. Great, thanks, Elisa. And let me first start by thanking everyone who have joined this session. I mean, COVID-19 is a global health crisis unlike any in recent history. It has destabilized the global economy and impacted billions of people around the world. Even though COVID-19 is the most urgent threat in the short term, we cannot forget that climate change is the biggest threat to us in the long term. Financial uncertainties will have a negative impact, and we're going to see investors and financial institutions to tighten their Person and be more cautious in the investment strategies. But as far as Vietnam is concerned, we know that there are serious PPF bankability issues. The defeating mechanism, tariff mechanism, which expires in November 2021, has been a key driving factor for the boom in this industry. And all the investors and developers are trying to meet the COD timeline of uh, 2021, November 2021, to achieve a tariff of 8.5 US cents per kilo hour for onshore. 9.8 per US cents offshore. Now, the question is how long will this boom last? There are developers and financial institutions and investors who have taken a long term view of the market and believe that Vietnam is going to be a priority market for them. Uh, yesterday, we heard that the government has in principle approved about 4.5 gigawatts of wind projects to be in PDP 7. And potentially, there may be an extension of the entire up to maybe December 2023. Now, that's great news for the industry. Uh, most of them believe that 1.2 to would be around 1 to 1 1.2 gigawatts would be installed before 2021, as for yesterday's sessions. And around 3 gigawatts would be put up by 2023 December, again by yesterday's session. Now, these are lofty numbers, big numbers. But who is going to finance these projects? all these existing issues of bankability and great uncertainties. Uh, we have an esteemed uh, panel of speakers, so we will be uh, we'll have a quick introduction about them today. Uh, so let's start with Arvinda. Can you just give a quick introduction and we'll go around the table? Thanks, I mean, uh, good morning, everybody. Great to be here. Uh, I, I hope my voice is clear because I see on the chat that uh, some people are complaining about the uh, hopefully this should be okay. Uh, my name is Arvinder Singh and I work for NRG. Today I'll be giving a short presentation for the introduction uh, about the role of wind measurements. So uh, see you in a bit. Uh, Olivier. Hi, Olivier Duguay uh, speaking. So nice to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. And thank you all for attending. Uh, I am uh, the chairman and CEO of the Blue Circle. We have been active in developing wind projects uh, for the last seven years um, in the region, uh, based in Singapore and active mainly in uh, Vietnam uh, with our first project. Dam uh, has been running since uh, two years ago, and uh, we are closing uh, or commissioning another 50 megawatts as we speak. Great, thanks, Steve. Uh, Steve Mercia here from Standard Charter Bank. Um, I am uh, part of the uh, finance team here in Asia, looking at Southeast Asia, uh, plus uh, North Asia and Australia. Uh, so uh, bank has been uh, across 
a number of uh, financing activities in Vietnam recently across uh, solar and wind. So uh, uh, it's my pleasure to be here to share uh, some views around the sector with, with everyone. Jeff? Uh, <clears throat> thanks, everyone. Sorry. Jeff Don from the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation. It's, uh, I'm the regional representative covering Southeast Asia and the Pacific and uh, looking at business development across the region, including, of course, in renewable energy. So really happy to be here and talk about Vietnam. I said hi, it's Tony Lyon, and Dick McKinney, and two guests that are just in And um, he's representing, let's say, the legal part of the, the industry there. So uh, before we start off with the panel session, I think, uh, as uh, Alisa said, we will have two presentations. Uh, the first one is going to be by Arvinda, and uh, he's going to speak on high quality wind resource assessment is key for raising project finance, followed by Jeff, uh, so who will speak on the support and So, uh, Arvinda, why don't you take it Yeah, thanks, Naveen. Um, I'm just going to start sharing my screen, and just let me know if it's okay. So again, a very good morning, everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, nice to be presenting. Um, you know, in a situation and extremely challenging. So uh, today, I will talk over the next ten minutes about uh, project and the role of wind measurements. Um, project, as such, is a very, very broad subject. Uh, minute sort of presentation so i'm just covering one part of project financing which is early stage wind measurement part a uh, quick introduction about me um you can connect with me on linkedin if everybody has access to that um and i've been i've been in international sales for 23 years now um i have been associated with the wind industry since, um, in 2005 um, so I've seen uh, quite a few ups and downs already, um, you know, within, within the last I have been fortunate to be working with NRG Systems for last year. Um, in my previous life, I was a professional athlete. I played squash uh, in Germany and UK uh, before getting back into studying and, you know, doing my master's and then finally um, getting so with the Chartered Institute of Marketing. Um, outside of work, if anybody wants to connect any football fans out there, please. Um, I'm a big football fan, and then currently I'm in India, a small team of under 12 kids that I train outside my work. So just as you know, uh, it's been it's been a phenomenal, run. Um, you know, just seeing uh, uh, you know interact. And, you know, I believe in strong partnerships with. Uh, uh, with customers and, and the shareholders and stakeholders within the industry and um, forward to, to further projects. Uh, um, NRG Systems um, is a brand, uh, a reputable brand and a high quality brand in the US. Uh, we were founded back in 1982. Um, years now um, in the industry, uh, serving 100 countries. We are now a um, wholly owned subsidiary of ESCO Technologies. Now you can go on the website of ESCO Technologies. I have a review of their portfolio. Own, uh, they're listed on the New York Stock Exchange, ESE. NRG has been a pioneer in the wind resource measurement side of business for a very, very long time. And natural progression you know we are off offering advanced solutions in solar as well we have a really it's a very dynamic local and country network and i'm going to talk about them as well in the next slide uh, for vietnam is dg technology uh, we have three sales offices uh, in sevilla covering the europe at least in africa region we have an office in beijing china covering china and then i'm based in bangalore covering asia pacific um, all the products are manufactured in the U.S. And um, really happy to be partnering with uh, BG Technologies 
from back 2003 was the first met Vietnam. Um, and DG has been um, really supporting uh, and supporting the customers and developers in, in Vietnam for a very long time. Um, I think over 500 met towers. Um, also very active in the solar 40 plus uh, weather stations. And then we're also going to talk about the live provide full service. So coming back to the subject is, you know, what's, what's the scenario today? And I would like to thank uh, my friend Jerry Randall of Wind Pioneers for this beautiful, a beautiful slide, I, I would say, you know, it's, uh, it's just, it just captures as well. Um, in the wind business. So we are looking at the turbine hub heights, the rotor dial, you slowly higher and higher, and then we are trying to compete on the measurement side with, you know, we talk about 100 meters, 120, 150, 157, you know, you name it. And I think in terms of the quality of data in class one sensors, we are not able to capture the whole uh, what's called the rotor equivalent wind speed, um, which is uh, something that you know the OEM uh, really would like to see from tip to tip in terms of the loads and longevity of the turbine at a site. So having said that, you can have really tall, uh, but at the same time, I think the the health issue, uh, uh, plus I think the environmental issue uh, is going to play a very significant role going forward. You know as situation because typically for a 150 meter met mass you're looking at 50 meters by 150 meters area that needs to be cleared up so I, I think there are a lot of issues that we can take high is good enough um, you know I know that consultants always yes hub height is preferred uh, but yeah at, at some point of time you have to draw the line uh, and we have technologies now well um, which can support of this uh, development on the uncertainty and the AEP side. So, bankability, you know, uh, very simply put, you know, bank that you have enough high quality data which is verifiable and quantifiable to a certain amount of uncertainty. So, when you look at project financing, Typically, measurement period is the most important period, uh, although there are certain other aspects related in terms of grid infrastructure, your transmission network, your land acquisition. But measurement is what the spare. So you normally start with the measurement. And a lot of data is a bankable data in simplistic terms. So, so there are different people involved in the whole process. Who will do their own analysis? We have the developer own analysis. We have lenders, engineers who are appointed to be nice uh, projections and to provide, you know, for the confidence and consultants who are hired. So I think when everybody looking at the same site, they are trying to come out with really unbiased projections so that that bankable data. So this is just one part of the what of the of the puzzle of the of, the, of project finance because this is what leads directly into your return on investments so if you don't have if you don't have really good energy projection based on your p75 and p90 that investors and the amount of due diligence that you have done um, to minimize the uncertainties and here I'm going to talk about the uncertainties on the measurement side uh, uncertainties on the plant losses and all the other factors which are so, you know, we can have a separate discussion about that. But a strong digital uh, to, to get your best return, the highest, I would say, uh, uh, you know, the numbers on bank. So typically when you look at the AEP uncertainty, uh, if you look at the right hand, um, you know, there are many sources, but the three most important ones, I think, which are quite relevant in any market, including Vietnam, is going to be measurements as high. These are the highest possible numbers. Not I'm talking about the lowest. Uh, could be as high as five. Your wind shear could be as high as seven percent, and your wind could be as high as eight percent in terms of overall uncertainty 
in your projections. The next few slides uh, are just some strategies. You know, in the red is the problem, in the green is an explanation uh, in terms of the proposal, um, what, need, what can be done, and, in, and obviously working with your or your developer consultant, tune it as you go along. So these are not set in stone, but these are ideas that are presented as market. Um, you know, what are the strategies? Because, you know, when I say extrapolating means win share, and if I go back to the previous slide, we're looking at about seven attached to a site as high as that if, you know, we don't have, you're not capturing the whole rotor space uh, altogether. So uh, typically, you know, hub height measurements require but what you can also do is you can look at economical mass, but mass which are shorter in height, you know, 50 or 60, 80 meter height, uh, easier to install, but you do need of extrapolation. And what you can do is you can look at new technologies like the LiDAR technology, which is now pretty much over a thousand units operating worldwide. Uh, independent consultants like DMVGL have done a fair amount of study on all sorts of LiDAR technology, Doppler uh, LiDAR or the direct stage two. And we can have a discussion offline about this, uh, different technologies, but I think that you know, any sort of LiDAR would be uh, complementing uh, an economical met mass to, do, to validate um, you know, wind speeds above the mast height. Looking at the second uh, option here, if you have, let's say, a couple of met mass um, uh, on uh, which are again economic towers. You look at, um, uh, you know, having a few lidars that are, um, you know, helping through the wind as well as extrapolating above the tower. The if you follow some some, some sort of this, so what what we are saying here is that uh, this methodology of using shorter met towers could help you replace the expensive. That is required in putting taller lattice type met, met towers. These could be temporary met towers that you can uh, install. Um, LIDARs for wind shear validation. These are all up for discussion. The, uh, also, looking at um, now this, the part of extrapolating horizontally. So, basically, means that how do you quantify your, your wind flow? I talked about the wind flow in terms of uncertainty, it could be as high as 8%. Um, so physically, or let's say technically, not, not possible to have a tower at every turbine location. So you can look at, uh, a, a, um, let's say, LIDARs, which can be used simultaneously uh, with a MET tower, um, possibly hub height, possibly lower than hub height, and, and you can look uh, extrapolating that with of those turbine, possible turbine locations. Um, and if you look at the graphic, uh, similarly explained, is, and you know, if you read, read through the text, um, you know, uh, to better understand the horizontal, uh, a LIDAR can be moved uh, between the points of interest, where, whereas one point remains fixed on the site, which, is, which could be your MET tower, and the LIDAR must, moves around, and you can look at, uh, uh, you know, simultaneously, you can, you can calibrate uh, three or four or maybe five units uh, at the same site, uh, three to six months, and then you can move it around. These are just ideas for extrapolating horizontal with lowest uh, uncertainty. For longer measurement periods, multiple units of LIDARs can be used, um, and this particular method ensures that you can data um, up to 200 meters at each potential turbine location that is directly traceable to a anemometry. So just to wind up in terms of uh, conclusion, what is that LIDAR technology uh, provides bankable data and obviously it has to be used properly within the guidelines. Any profitable wind farms that have been constructed with LIDARs. LIDARs have been used by, worldwide by most, almost all developers. Foresee is that in the post COVID 19 scenario, an environment issue, we, we foresee that LIDARs will reduce or replace 
tall towers. Um, just so, something recently I saw uh, on LinkedIn, and you can see this as well, this is from Res UK. First time they've used a LiDAR, this is a ZX LiDAR in Scotland um, for a site on the pre-development as a standalone. And you know, it just says that, you know, Res believes that LiDARs are the bankable bin measurements as this, they are better, cheaper, faster, and safer than to uh, thank you for the presentation. If you have any questions, please do let me know or drop me an email. Thanks so much. Great. Arvinder, thank you so much for the presentation. Now I would like uh, Jeff to present yours. So, uh, USDFC for short is the US uh, Development Finance Institution. Uh, I'm based in Bangkok. Uh, DFC is uh, new, uh, so to speak. Um, we uh, we are sorry. Looking at the screen, we are we are new but old, meaning uh, we replaced Overseas Private Investment Corporation. It's our predecessor, um, and so what you see on screen is, of course, our our uh, current portfolio based on OPIC uh, activity. Um, you'll see that. Uh, geographically, you know, we are um, a little bit underweight in in uh, in Asia, in the Indo-Pacific, as we call it. Uh, and of course, I'm here to try to uh, change that. And uh, there are reasons behind that uh, relative uh, level of uh, um, low distribution, uh, but I won't go into that that now. I'm going to talk about the DFC, uh, of course, because I have to. But but really, you should take it as as an example, right, of what DFIs do uh, what we offer uh, because really what, what we provide our, our fellow DFIs provide and I want to set this uh, out front um, before we get into kind of the details about what DFIs are doing during the COVID um, crisis because a lot of times DFIs get confused with ECAs, uh, export credit agencies or public sector official development assistance um, and, and, and we're neither so I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Uh, so, um, sorry, if you could go to the prior slide, Li Ming. Okay, okay, so, it's, all right, so thanks. Next slide, and then the next one. Um, yeah, so the second slide that was there just a second ago talks about what, what okay, please hold it there. Oops, one back one. Okay, so the, the investment priorities are the ones for DFC uh, per se and reflected in, in other DFIs as well. Uh, energy, of course, is, is critical. Uh, uh, thankfully there, I've got uh, a couple of wind turbines up as opposed to something else uh, for this discussion. Um, if you can go to the products page, Next, uh, try to move through this fairly quickly. Um, that's okay. What, what, sorry, uh, sorry for these issues, but if we could actually just leave it on that on the pyramid page, uh, I'll, I'll just talk from there for now. So while, while we're getting to the pyramid page, the product page just covered, uh, again, uh, products that most DFIs have. Uh, such as loans and loan guarantees, political risk insurance, um, uh, equity investment, as well as some have technical assistance facilities. Uh, okay, so there, there you see it. Um, and, and, and we, like others, also have a private equity investment fund uh, program. For, for this purpose, clearly, most of us are focused on debt financing, project financing in particular, as well as political risk insurance that may assist. Um, technical assistance is, of course, of interest to, to many. That's uh, a grant-type program, and I can get into that if people have questions. But really what I wanted to focus on um, is this pyramid, again, just to clarify where we fit in as DFIs into the whole kind of project cycle. Uh, by and large, our role is to uh, kind of come in at the end of the development process and, and provide the, the bulk of the capital necessary, right, to construct and, and operate. Uh, so we come in, you know, uh, uh, once things are pretty much lined up, um, you know, PPAs are almost in hand, 
uh, land is basically there, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, funding for construction is needed within, you know, say six to 12 months, um, depending on the circumstances. You know, what we, what we don't do typically, again, is, is get involved earlier um, by providing uh, feasibility study grants uh, for projects to figure out whether or not things make sense from a commercial perspective. Um, and, and of course, by, by, uh, from that, you can, you can understand uh, that we also don't get involved even earlier on in the process when a government is, is, is looking for advice on how to, for example, start a renewable energy program. Um, so we kind of come in at the end. Uh, there are, of course, exceptions to everything I just mentioned including with in, in terms of what we now, now as DFC offer. Uh, but again, I'll leave that for, for Q&A if people are interested. Um, if you could go to the next uh, slide, please, and the last one uh, with text. Yep, great. So DFI support during the COVID crisis then. I mean, many of you who are familiar with us have, have, you know, understand clearly our focus is on our existing portfolio and pipeline, active pipeline, making sure that our clients can make it through the crisis. Um, uh, and, and ones that we are actively, you know, uh, uh, in dis closing discussions, shall we say, um, you know, again, they're also trying to adjust, you know, total project costs and timelines and what have you to make sure everything works together. Um, uh, prospective clients, uh, typically, you know, uh, we're of course still eager to support, um, but really the constraints that they face are, are, are more related to the market that they're in. Uh, the, uh, supply chain, et cetera, et cetera. And then with respect to new clients, you know, we're, we, we are starting to see folks in markets where the private sector, you know, has been comfortable historically providing uh, debt or insurance starting to come to us because there are challenges in those markets uh, from the private sector perspective. Um, so then the, the corollary in terms of actual project and transactions, you know, like I mentioned earlier, Existing loans, you know, are, are being, where necessary, being proactively restructured. Uh, so providing additional tenor, restructuring the amortization, extended grace periods perhaps, um, or even uh, additional funding if, if that's appropriate and the project can sustain it. Um, new projects, as, as implied earlier, uh, really need to be assessed in light of the changing circumstances uh, all around, including, of course, in particular, revised, potentially revised, uh, national uh, power development plans and uh, the demand profile. Uh, and then finally, you know, what, what everybody's focused on and what I, of course, want to leave room for discussion is uh, the prospects for Vietnam. And as you can see there, uh, my, my belief, and I'm eager to hear what others think and, and see, uh, is that really, you know, looking forward, excuse me, I'm utilizing too many things and my phone is falling over, um, the uh, the situation in Vietnam is is in terms of the wind right program and and it's particularly as we uh, are anticipating an extension um, uh, and and you know revisions to the fit etc from that I think those are the key things that are affecting financing prospects it's not really um, the, the 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 bank market or the DFI market you know we like others stand ready and able to support projects. Um, uh, if and when they get to, uh, I can say, bankability from the PPA perspective, uh, et cetera, because uh, that's also part of what we, of course, are, are looking for. Uh, and so um, from our perspective, I think developers should be glad to hear that we are, we are still very liquid. We, we are, that's our role is to fill the gap. Uh, if there is a gap, you know, in Vietnam, I think, of course, the situation is a little bit different, as, as you all are well aware. Um, and so we continue to look for progress in terms of advancing a PPA, uh, but it's not a situation where uh, we're pulling back uh, for, for COVID-related reasons. I'll end it there, and thanks for listening. Thanks, Jeff. I think what we will do is we'll just move uh, to the panel session now. We just about less than that. Uh, I think we'll just dive into the question that I want to ask. Uh, has COVID impacted, COVID impacted all, almost all industries? How has it impacted you? All of you, let's start with you. Yeah, hello. <laughs> hello, everyone. I, I'm not sure I've heard the, the, the question clearly, but uh, uh, if, I, if I understand why, is how, how, how the COVID have uh, 
uh, impacted our, our operations. Um, um, the usual uh, answer to that uh, I give is that, uh, you know, when you do a, a project development and project construction, uh, especially in wind, it takes years. And uh, we are here talking about, uh, you know, average uh, development time, I think, uh, or at least for talking about our, our uh, experience around four years, uh, you know, four to five years in, uh, in Vietnam. Um, you know, sometimes more than that uh, elsewhere. Uh, so I would say the current situation, you know, just being evolving in the last three months uh, doesn't have any uh, or very few impact for us uh, as it's very, very short term blip uh, compared to the, the, the horizon and the time scale of uh, our development. Uh, same thing for the construction. A little bit more uh, impact on the construction, of course, if we are, if we were to be for the projects which are just right in the construction right now. Uh, yes, we had some some impact, short term impact, of course, uh, on our uh, the teams. Uh, you know the uh, potential uh, deployment of, of uh, staff uh, on the site. Uh, hopefully, again, Vietnam have uh, uh, managed that uh, crisis very well, uh, and I think we we should congr congratulate. Uh, for, for their, their handling of, of this crisis. Uh, it be, has been very, very well uh, uh, handled. Uh, and, and so far from our perspective on our project, uh, currently under construction, uh, we had very, very minimal uh, disruption from this uh, COVID situation. Uh, up to you, Ernest. Steve, how has it impacted your industry, the bank industry, I would say? Yeah, thanks, Naveen. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, we, we, we work in project finance, which has uh, uh, typically uh, uh, relatively long lead time um, uh, for getting from starting a transaction towards towards closing it. So, I mean, we were actually uh, just uh, sort of uh, COVID uh, hit, hit globally sort of in, in, in March time, sort of we were sort of uh, transacting a, um, a solar project actually in Vietnam itself. Uh, but this project has been going on for for quite a while, so I think the uh, uh, the longevity of of project finance uh, from uh, from uh, origination to, to to closing is is uh, is significant. Uh, so you're potentially looking at 12, 18 months usually. Uh, so uh, it sort of has helped us to uh, to to bridge the, uh, the 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 maximum impact in in, in March April. So. A lot of the transactions that uh, we were working on, which were um, largely sort of uh, well developed, have have continued the momentum. Uh, but obviously, there has been uh, some obviously some time impact from a from a, uh, for new projects or projects which were probably earlier in in the process. But overall, um, yeah, I think that the, the business is is is, is continued. It's uh, it's uh, it's uh, the pipeline has continued sort of to develop. Uh, and I have to say, definitely Vietnam is probably uh, the country in Southeast Asia, particularly on renewables, where um, uh, the requests for um, uh, for for work from our end hasn't hasn't really diminished. So uh, it's good for us to see that. It's obviously testament to what's being done in the country across both wind and solar, um, and obviously testament to how Vietnam has actually tackled the the, the COVID crisis. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I've been getting some questions. Uh, one is related to Arvinda's uh, presentation. Arvinda, the, I mean, how would you compare the quality of wind data uh, between wind mast and LIDAR? Because that is one. And the other thing is most of the wind mast is about 120 meters. And we're seeing, uh, you know, higher turbine types. So we're seeing 150 to 160 <coughs> meter hub heights. So uh, do you see a, a correlation between two would be better for you to get better results? It is the same as a class one anemometer. So there is, there is really no technology um, and a cup anemometry. So uh, same. And, uh, and typically, if you look at no matter how hard you make your wind data, anything, anything is typically 2%. <laughs> so, you know, it is, you know, it depends on what you really want to do. So, you know, from a developer's perspective, you know, when I said in one of my slides about bankability, like people involved in the whole process. So you, in the center is a developer and then you, you've got your OEA. 
talk to, and then you have your independent consultant, and then you have your lender. This is, there are four different parts, of the, but the whole issue is that how, as a developer, you're able to, one, you have verified source, more important than even talking about the uncertainty on the measurements. You can have a class two, but if you have a really high quality measurement period and you are able to verify, and I think your, your independent consultants will give you good marks for that. So, and having said, uh, the second point obviously is 120 meters met must, and I read with some of our customers in Vietnam. I mean, you're looking at 140 meter met towers going in now. You know, yeah, 140 meters, but that's really tall. You know, tall. You know, how, how far do you want to go? There has to be a limit at some point. And what we foresee in the future, I mean, six months from today or could be 18 months. But the future is that, you know, when we talk about environment, we talk about health and safety standards, towers, I think you will start seeing a change. LIDAR now, both stage three and stage two LIDARs are really priced. So if they are comparable to a class one and they're I'm not sure why you should be putting tall towers. So, got it. I mean, getting. I mean, talking about lidars. Just want to check with uh, our commercial bank, Mr. Steve. Uh, have uh, banks started to consider lidar data to be bankable when it comes to project financing? Yeah, um, I think specifically we have uh, seen this in, in offshore wind. So uh, to my recollection, we have already uh, sort of looked at a project which uh, in offshore wind was utilizing uh, LiDAR. Um, I think the underlying sort of premise is obviously data quality um, uh, and on-site data quality is, is obviously for us uh, the key. Um, obviously. Um, uh, not all PF bankers are, are technical experts as well. So obviously there is a, there is a strong reliance on um, uh, independent uh, assessment of the data. I think that's a, that's a key, uh, that's a key uh, feature of, of what we look at. Uh, nonetheless, obviously, um, uh, you know, if sponsors, developers are, uh, are, are, are assessing data which is of, of better quality, I think that the market will be open for it, uh, the banking market. It's a more a question around ensuring that uh, whoever is assessing the data, um, uh, the quality of the data itself is, uh, is acceptable for, uh, for, for these assets. So, you know, we obviously, from a debt perspective, um, uh, we are uh, typically on a project finance uh, asset, we are taking uh, you know, 10, 12, 15 plus years of exposure. So obviously, uh, ensuring that the data and the assessment is uh, is uh, is acceptable is obviously uh, key uh, for us to look at uh, at these assets. Uh, just running to Olivia here. We we know that project finance has been quite quite a challenge in Vietnam, uh, and you've done you're one of the few international in the developers to do projects there. Do you see local banks being more involved in? financing projects in Vietnam? And how do you navigate the approval process in the projects, in wind power projects there? I mean, it's the approval process is quite cumbersome and you have experience on both sides. Yes, thank you, Naveen, uh, good question. Uh, on um, uh, the local bank's involvement, um, as you mentioned, we have been uh, to close uh, uh, non-recourse uh, project financing for a wind project with a uh, Vietnamese bank, uh, 17, 17 years, I must just uh, uh, mention, uh, $14 million uh, for a Damnai project. So, um, uh, and, and, and it was one, one with the, the largest uh, uh, bank uh, in Vietnam. Uh, and frankly, since then, uh, we have seen very little action from uh, this bank or the others uh, you know, um, and, and mainly I think, uh, first of all, because they were active in uh, solar, I think, uh, again, a competition from solar will be on the, on, on the financing as well as on the technology side uh, always. Uh, so they've been very active in financing their clients, their Vietnamese clients for solar, first of all. Um, and, and secondly, uh, I think uh, very few, uh, you, you know, the, 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 the um, 
uh, balance sheet size uh, of these banks uh, is very limited uh, in an international um, you know, uh, perspective um, comparison. So, so, so their ability to also project finance long-term uh, renewable energy or any project uh, is very limited. Uh, so, so far, um, I don't think we'll see much more action uh, on that front uh, from local banks uh, than what we have seen. They could be in a limited part, and maybe we'll um, you know, talk, talk about it and, and come back on this, but they could be uh, involved in limited part as the representant uh, or the local uh, partner Local uh, local bank uh, in an ECA financing uh, scheme, uh, but otherwise uh, I don't see them, uh, you know, being really involved uh, much more uh, in the future um, for in wind. Of course, because when we are talking about all these uh, uh, gigawatt, uh, the, the, the gigawatt we are talking about in the future to be uh, implemented in Vietnam, uh, you know, the money, and we have, you know, we've said that uh, for a long time now, uh, the money will have to come from abroad for sure. And it, it's, it's already the case right now. Uh, no, so, so the second question was on the on the permitting side. Uh, yes, uh, that's very. You know, the, uh, I used to say that. Uh, you know, I'm I'm also coming from another communist country, which is uh, France, uh, as a joke, of course. Uh, but but it's a you know we we are also in France uh, a very 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 administrative uh, country um, uh, with um, a huge. Uh, I mean, processes, uh, that's the same in Vietnam. It's really, really very difficult to navigate. Uh, frankly, you need, of course, you have your, your own local teams, your own local partners. It's, uh, what, what is even more difficult is that it's different from one province to the other. Uh, so, as you know, you know, it's, it's a, uh, you know there's a lot of uh, decentralization, decentralization um, also uh, in place in Vietnam. Uh, so, you know, very different from one, one uh, uh, province uh, to the other, so you don't have you, you must you know choose carefully uh, your province uh, of action uh, before uh, going into it. But uh, anyway, it will be difficult, even more so as you mentioned for for international players, of course, because we're committed to international standards. Uh, again, our our bankers, of course, uh, will um, only you know uh, uh, expect that that from us uh, so we are re relying with uh, and, and uh, on uh, applying on the equator principles ifc guidelines uh, for our projects uh, development and that's making also life difficult um, because it's you know, on, on the permitting side of course also thanks uh jeff i have a question for you just came now uh what conditions must be satisfied for D DFIs to finance projects? Um, sure, thanks for the question. Uh, for, for DFIs to finance projects, I think uh, uh, developers should look at us in the same way as commercial banks from an underwriting perspective, right? So we need to see commercially viable projects um, all the appropriate uh, legal, regulatory, et cetera, issues, permits, et cetera, uh, need to be uh, in place. Uh, we do a very thorough um, due diligence and underwriting process, same as uh, many of the banks. Um, uh, and beyond that, of course, as Olivier just referenced, uh, we have, uh, you know, we stick to international standards in terms of uh, environmental, social, and labor. Uh, and, and most agencies, most DFIs, uh, basically work with the IFC performance standards. Beyond that, you know, uh, of course, for most people, it, what then makes, you know, besides the additional hassle of uh, environmental and social, what makes um, DFIs uh, different um, than, you know, a commercial bank, uh, typically, of course, an international commercial bank. Uh, and I would say, again, that, that our role is to fill the gaps. So we, we are ready to take on additional risk compared to commercial banks in markets which are typically, you know, having new initiatives. Um, in, in, in Vietnam, I would say, frankly, that wind at scale is still a new initiative. Um, I mean, there have been, of course, some success stories like uh, Blue Circle uh, and some domestic, clearly, but, you know, nothing near the scale that uh, has been on the, on the book, so to speak, for uh, in the planning books, so to speak, for, for quite a while. Um, and, and, and so that's really our role. And again, we are eager as DFIs to come in and support Vietnam, 
Um, but our key issue, and I don't want to make this kind of a, a whole bankability conversation, um, but, you know, just to, uh, just to uh, be clear, right? I mean, the issue for us is um, that projects still need to be structured well, uh, right? And risks need to be allocated appropriately. Um, and with respect to things uh, where the government is clearly the best able to take on risk, and I'm not talking necessarily about uh, EVN payment risk, which which really was the focus for a long time and still is for some, but the basic things like uh, for intermittent power curtailment, uh, change in law, uh, obviously, uh, political force majeure, and so on. So uh, these are things that we, like others, continue to uh, raise in conversations uh, whenever possible with uh, with the government. And Jeff, I mean, that leads to uh, my question for Hai, because I was going to be asking a very similar question to Hai. Hai, we, we are, all of us talk about bankability. Uh, uh, what, according to you, are the ways to mitigate bankability issues? Uh, thanks, Nabi. Um, can you hear me? Um, so, uh, yeah. So in terms of uh, bioavailability uh, for um, the PPIs, uh, as well, uh, right now the more PPIs by uh, the MYT uh, non-negotiable template. Um, so this uh, reduces the room for project sector developer uh, to negotiate uh, uh, for release of the term of the PPIs for the non-negotiable project. Uh, having said that, in practice, uh, we can still uh, negotiate certain terms with uh, in the end uh, to clarify uh, certain conditions. Uh, uh, for example, in terms of uh, curtailment risk, um, um, this is one of the principal risk for project financing. And uh, in practice, we can uh, clarify something like uh, if the um, uh, basically, under the current uh, model PPI for uh, for wind, as you know, uh, EVN they adopt a uh, concept of uh, take and play. So, basically, if uh, find the electron generated from the wind farm, um, uh, EVN will only pay uh, for whatever electron uh, they have uh, actually actually received and, and uh, pay on that. So, they not take off the arrangement, I mean, they will really. Uh, and as we play in the case of uh, which uh, projection uh, of CEO technical uh, issue. Uh, so, for example, in the case of breakdown of wind or failure uh, uh, by the project company to comply with grid uh, code regulation, uh, then again they have a broad right to fill uh, uh, the without any specific uh, payment termination. Uh, Compensation for the EVN project. So, what we can do in practice is we can add certain few things to clarify that EVN can exercise the curve seven rights only in terms limited to the event where they remain compliant on their side with the relevant grid connection. Uh, and we call them as an applicable uh, for, for EVN. The TPL, as you know, EVN, they have multiple uh, entities, they involve uh, a different entity, they can be uh, different entity, they can uh, sign it and contract on some if the uh, grid connection at the uh, 110, uh, then uh, uh, South um, uh, Regional uh, PC and the EVN, they will sign a grid connection agreement. But for um, you know, um, payment on the NZ, uh, it will be under EPPC, uh, our trading company under EPN. Uh, and also, in terms of this pay, they are subject to the procedure under, um, you know, a national work dispatch center. So, uh, when we clarify um, to extend, um, you know, to extend uh, uh, EVM purchase, uh, uh, so, uh, um, Standard and regulation. That is the first point. Um, the second point, uh, the, the second issue is uh, the uh, As we all know, um, under Circular 2, uh, 
last year when uh, MRT they uh, removed or they cut off one year revenue uh, in case of the uh, year before and then uh, project the EPI. Uh, even though the drafting is um, implied that it will be applicable to the place where even before and then you know, the developer has uh, tried to elect the termination or not, uh, but because uh, this is the, the cap, then um, you know, when this new resolution provides, for example, then uh, the cost of NYP they can interpret uh, uh, more strictly and uh, it can impact. But the good news is that they um, in the revised uh, model PPI last year uh, and uh, they removed that cap. Uh, but the new issue coming up uh, is still they no form of uh, termination formula, how to calculate and how the developer can be certain, the financier can be certain that uh, the payment uh, termination from the EVA they can cover you know, uh, outstanding debt for financing. Uh, investment cost from uh, you know, right. uh, project by project basis, and this is just an um, independent view. Uh, when we act for specific project, um, when we negotiate specific uh, contract, because uh, even when we review successfully the first one, uh, if the, the second people come to negotiate for the second project, they may say no or say maybe more conservative because uh, this is a different project. And, uh, handle by different person in, in the EPA. So I cannot say 1% every other command in the way to set up the EPA. But uh, yes, we can say our view on that. Got it. Uh, now, we're almost running out of time, but I just want to go quick around the table here. Uh, what uh, What are your views on the fit extension which has been proposed by the government? Olivia. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Navin. Uh, for, on, the, on the fit extension, uh, I think uh, that's crucial. That's absolutely crucial to keep the momentum for the whole uh, industry. Um, I think, again, uh, uh, we have seen, uh, we have been waiting. Uh, we must, uh, you know, uh, precise that or, or um, uh, emphasize that, uh, that we have been waiting for new master plan approvals for one year and a half now uh, with the new planning law. I, I, I don't know if you're some of uh, our auditors are, are aware of this, but there is a new planning law. Uh, I've been uh, um, uh, tried to to implement uh, to, to be implemented in Vietnam for for last year, uh, and uh, that means that the no master plan approvals, meaning the ma the major, the most important uh, approval of all for a wind project of any power projects, have been uh, postponed so far for one year and a half now. So it's it's uh, crucial. So it's crucial that it starts. Uh, as well as, as uh, then having an, another finite tariff for these projects, because everything has been stalled, all the new projects have been stalled uh, since last year. Uh, and uh, what we're looking at now and uh, experiencing are projects being built only because they've been um, you know, uh, in the master plan and uh, permitted uh, two years ago. Uh, so uh, definitely there will be a gap, there will be a gap uh, you know, coming. Uh, if there is no, still no master plan approvals, it seems to be moving, but uh, not yet, uh, 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 not not yet uh, confirmed. Uh, and we so so we need absolutely need to have visibility. The whole sector needs visibility. Uh, of course, us uh, up, upstream, but uh, the bankers, uh, the, the turbine providers, uh, the equipment providers also. So we need certainty. We need visibility, and it's not what we have today. Today, for the moment, projects will be, uh, wind wind power will be stopped. In November of next year, first of November of next year, and and it's it's going to be finished. You know, there is no more visibility after this first uh, uh, of November of next year. So again, uh, for the moment, we are planning to uh, and we are um, firing people because we don't have any visibility after that date. Uh, so again, uh, crucial, crucial, of course, to have uh, an extension of the fit and the master plan approvals to regime. Thank you. I guess uh, same thing to Linda. This extension could be good for you. No sales of lie down. Yeah, I know. Uh, thanks, I mean, Yeah, absolutely. And I, I agree with Oliver. Like, you know, it's, um, I mean, so like, you know, in my presentation, I said, you know, measurement is the tip of the spear. So you see any sort of a wave coming much earlier 
that anticipated. So yeah, we've been we've been pretty good in terms of we've done really well over the past. I would say through the COVID scenario. I mean, slow down uh, because people want to measure, and that's that's the thing they want to do. So uh, so yeah, it, it you know fingers crossed. <laughs> Jeff, uh, what are you that the extension of fit if that materializes? Right. right. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, it's uh, uh, anticipated, uh, and it will be a good thing. Uh, you know, of course, it depends uh, what the details are. Uh, you know, I think we heard yesterday that um, you know uh, there was approval for seven uh, gigawatts of wind to go uh, into the. PDP, um, which suggests that the, the government is eager still uh, to put the, the big numbers on the grid. Um, so now it just needs to, I think, demonstrate also an equivalent uh, effort um, and support in terms of the uh, other aspects of, of, of um, the legal and regulatory framework that are, are needed to, to actually mobilize capital to support that. Um, you know, my, my, my uh, own view is um, uh, you know, we'll see an extension uh, of two years. Um, uh, tariff, uh, feed-in tariff will come down. Uh, some deals will get done, as, as was discussed yesterday. Um, and uh, hopefully, though, during that process, it'll become evident that, again, the scale isn't there um, uh, because people will be utilizing uh, uh, structures to address the bankability issues that that perhaps aren't scalable. Again, I think there's a lot of structures that rely on uh, local bank participation, uh, assumption of some of these risks. Uh, and again, that all boils down to their capacity to take on additional EVN uh, exposure uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so um, you know, I'm, uh, I equally look forward to it. Uh, I will admit that we are also some, one of the institutions taking part in that in those discussions to find stopgap measures, shall we say. Um, but our, our eye is still on the, on the price, so to speak, of real uh, fundamental changes to the PPA. understand. I think we kind of understood what Jeff and Olivier wanted to say about how, how they see the market in terms of bullishness. But Steve and Hai, just want to get your views as well. How bullish are you about the Vietnam market? Yeah, look, I mean, we uh, <clears throat> we have been uh, we have been quite active in the market there, primarily uh, on on the solar side for obvious reasons. That obviously solar had uh, uh, the the twenty nineteen sort of completion date, and obviously you know, most of the assets are are up and running now. Um, I think our view is that um, you know, echoing sort of what Olivier and uh, and, and the panelists and Jeff have said. Um, what the market probably is more challenged about is uh, regulatory uncertainty. That's one risk which definitely uh, will, uh, will, will will upset the whole um, uh, infra sort of uh, uh, sphere of, of, of financing, development, etc. I think that's that's definitely one risk that uh, you know should be taken away uh, around the fit, you know, the, the PDP, etc. Um, uh, I would say, and sort of uh, at least sort of what we see across uh, sort of what's happened on the solar side, some of uh, Olivier's projects, etc., that the market adapts uh, in terms of uh, you know uh, yes, can it go to seven gigawatts or not? That that's a that's a question, but but the market does adapt. So in terms of sponsors stepping up, lenders stepping up, local lenders, DFIs, uh, institutions such as Jeff, etc., um, uh, there is there is the adaptability of the market. Um, so we are, you know, we are relatively, I would say, bullish. Obviously, subject to once again uh, the regulatory nature of the uh, of the fit, etc., approvals uh, being in place. Um, uh, and once that uh, is in place, then there is a, a clear path towards getting to, uh, to to financing. Now, financing can be stitched up. Um, at least we have the tools to say, listen, this is, these are the parameters, these are the goalposts, the, and let's, let's, let's play within these parameters. I just got a question, and I want everyone to be really quick on this. Uh, 
what are your key messages to the government on the current uh, feed and tariff situation? Key message. And uh, maybe we we'll start with uh, Jeff on this. Um, sure. I, mean, I, th I think the key message uh, uh, that you know, the market remains very eager, you know, uh, um, development finance institutions and others also remain very eager to support the government and in its initiative. Uh, but again, that we don't see it happening at scale uh, unless changes are made. Um, and I, I can only speak for, I mean, I hear of others, but I can only speak sort of, uh, you know, for, for U.S. government in that we, you know, as DFC, but also our colleagues uh, elsewhere, um, you know, at the embassy and USAID and so are, are uh, consistently sending that message whenever possible. Um, you know, some of you know that, that, that USAID has been uh, uh, driving the, the, the DVPA program in, in Vietnam. And so, you know, of course, many conversations take place around that. So we do have those opportunities. Um, but, uh, you know, that, to me, that's, that's the key message. Uh, that said, you know, I think they'll wait and see what happens and, and, uh, and then revisit once, uh, once the next, uh, the current fit uh, extended uh, ends. Good. Uh, Olivia, I know you already spoke about the fit, but what is the key message to the government now? And, uh, you know, let's be about the key message. Yeah, key message, I think, is uh, to bring back uh, trust and confidence uh, because uh, it has been, uh, you know, uh, largely dented by uh, what the, the government have been, have been doing uh, lately. Uh, so, again, I know the situation is difficult. I know we are not the only one, uh, of course, and uh, we're in this COVID situation. I think uh, that maybe the, I'm sure that the, the government have, have other priorities. Uh, but definitely for the sake of our sector, our, you know, all the players in the sector, we need to, uh, to have trust and confidence in Vietnam uh, to, you know, give us uh, visibility and, and uh, support and continue support, uh, or, uh, at least even not, not, not maybe in the, in the tariff uh, itself, but anyway, in the visibility to, to, the, to the sector. Uh, I won't I want, uh, emphasize enough. The fact that uh, no master plan approvals for one year and a half is unheard of. I've been hurting a lot of the, the players in the in the, uh, the country, active in the country, and will continue to have a, a lasting impact. So, so we need absolutely need to have or the government of uh, of Vietnam. I think uh, needs to uh, keep, keep uh, you know, get get things moving at least. Uh, and of course, here are you hear the voice of the MIT on the feeding tariff extension. Uh, Steve, a uh, quick one from you. What are your key messages? You come from the commercial bank side. No, we share the same view. So, um, uh, as said earlier, we, you know, uh, we, you know, ideally, sort of, obviously, there's a, there's a strong government uh, ministry backing around, sort of, you know, uh, stabilizing the uh, the fit and making sure that uh, the regulatory risk is taken uh, away. I think there are obviously uh, inherent challenges on their own uh, with respect to uh, the, the, uh, the, the underlying uh, contractual uh, risk allocation. So obviously um, uh, we should, uh, uh, you know, uh, take as much, uh, the government hopefully can take as much risk uh, as possible out of the equation, obviously, and uh, uh, let the developers and, and financiers and everybody engaged in the sector to sort of focus on uh, on, on getting the uh, the megawatts up and running. Everyone, I think this has been a pretty good uh, session. Uh, I would uh, now like to pass it back to Alisa for taking this forward. Thanks a lot for joining, and thanks all the one everyone in the, <coughs> join the session. Thanks, Naveen, and, and thank you to all of our speakers for participating in this panel. Um, as Naveen mentioned, um, some of you were having uh, problems hearing hi um, from Baker McKenzie uh, during his intervention. Um, so in the follow-up email, which will include all presentations and a link to the recording of all these sessions, we'll also include a bit more information um, from Mr. Hai's intervention. So you have that handy. Um, um, thank you again to all of our speakers, and we'll see you again in half an hour uh, for the offshore wind session.